include you. I don't know. Maybe part of it's the fact that you're in a hurry. You've grown up on instant orange juice. Flip a dial, instant entertainment. Dial seven digits, instant communication. Turn a key, push a pedal, instant transportation. Flash a card, instant money. Shove in a problem, push a few buttons, instant answers. But some problems you can't get quick answers to no matter how much you want them. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings and welcome to The Anadromist. This is Burn Power and it's a fine day in Tbilisi, Georgia. Uh, really beautiful weather today and I'm glad to be here looking out at uh, the tower of the Kinos Sahli, the uh, cinema house. And uh, they're having an international film festival in a week or so. I'm, I'm thinking of checking that out. Anyway, enough of that. On to the topic of the day, which is time. We are continuing in our series on time. And uh, we've already discussed many aspects of time. Uh, this will be uh, continuing with the need to live in time. One of the, my central tenants in this whole thing is we live against time. That is to say, we live as if time doesn't matter, or as if, more importantly, as if time is always our enemy. So whether it's through people trying to make themselves look young, act young for all of their lives, which is something I haven't hardly talked about on this, but I've certainly thought about it. And there's a lot that I've thought about that I'm not going to be getting to. Um... Uh, in a sense, this is all introductory notes on time for people who probably have never thought much about it before. Because even though I've thought about these since the, uh, jeepers, since the mid early 90s, I think whenever I start talking about these things, I do notice that people tend to, they kind of say, oh yeah, time. And then the more I talk, the more they start realizing, oh, time, you know. So one of the, the problems is we live against time. We tend to see, uh, science has kind of trained us to see time as the clock. So whenever you think of time, you think of a clock. And that's not right. Time is what happens in the moments of our lives. And everything experiences time, not as a tick, tick, tick of the clock, but rather everything is moving slightly differently. Of course, on a quantum subatomic level, that's like really minim, minuscule, but you know, who's to say? Uh, everything experiences time differently and we certainly do. The question is how to stop fighting time and how to live inside of it, uh, with it, along with it. That isn't to say time is always friendly. That isn't to say, uh, people who've lived traditional existences in the past always had a good deal. No, they didn't. Uh, one of the reasons why we live against time is because at a certain point it became convenient and efficient to live the way we do now. But the problem is that's left us with this kind of crippling postmodern self-consciousness, which is not healthy for what it means to be a human being whatsoever. Not to mention our fractured relationships with everything in the world from, you know, the physical raw materials of the world to, you know, the animal life, uh, and everything. I am not a politically correct person when it comes to, uh, you know, almost anything. However, I will acknowledge, Hey, human beings have treated the world like swine. That is actually, we treat swine better than we <laughs> swine probably treat the world better than, than we do. Although pigs tend to, uh, muck things up as they, especially when they're penned up. Uh, actually, pigs are meant to run free, but even when they run free, especially when they're an invasive species, they tend to really muck things up. And that's how we're treating the world through our bad use of our time, through treating time as, as an enemy. Well, I've made that case in, 
in earlier episodes. You can go back and figure that out and see if I'm uh, if I have anything to say. Well, so what I came to is that we one of the ways to live in time is through understanding the memory. But I still haven't gotten down to your specific memories yet. And one of the ways that I think is important to get there is to start understanding where we are in history. Now, I'm not going to be stating where we are in history right now. I mean, I've kind of said that with this, you know, postmodern blah, blah, blah. But uh, that's also what I'm slowly, it turns out, working out in my How We Got Here series. And even then, only uh, looking at life since uh, after World War II. But... We need to have some idea of the value of history. It's my contention that uh, knowing history helps us locate ourselves in time, in the, in the passage of time, and thus start to have some idea how to break out of this postmodern now, wow, sort of consciousness, which is really, it's addictive. It's an addictive form of consciousness, which has really kind of gotten to us. But before we go on to the importance and some of the uses, good uses of understanding history, I have to put some large warning signs up here. Danger. History can be really, really badly misused, just as your memories can be badly misused. You know, um, when you meet a couple of, when you meet someone and every time they talk about someone, they always talk about how bad they are. That's a misuse of the memory. That is to say, you're using your memory of that person to always go, this person, I don't, you know, I don't know. That is to say, certainly not showing that person either respect or love. And uh, people do that all the time. History is the same way. Uh, we can come up with our, you know, kind of pre-fab- pre-formulated, prefabricated ideas of what has happened. Uh, and where do we get these ideas? From the media, from uh, our friends, from most dangerously of all, from propaganda. Um, so my warnings about history coincide pretty exactly with my warnings about memory. And we're going to come back to talking about memory in the last episode, which will be the next one. So the first thing we need to understand about history is what's called historicism. And C.S. Lewis has a great essay, I think it's simply called, on historicism. And I would highly recommend that essay. And the idea goes something like this, without getting into all of his detail, which you really should read. And that is, it's, you could put it like this, is that we know something about the direction of history. That, that somehow we are in, in possession of, the, of what we know about the facts of, of the way history is going. Another way you could just this, he uses the word chronological snobbery, and which it always means that we know now more than they knew then. You know, the past, they were always uh, primitive, uh, you know, <laughs> you know they, they really didn't understand anything. We, however, uh, have achieved some sort of pinnacle of, uh, of understanding, and we know more. And there are certainly ways in which you could say, yeah, we know more about, say, um, I don't know, you know, we have more access to understanding concepts of psychology or sanitation or health or these kinds of things. But do, have we really changed? That's a different side of, that's a different question whatsoever, uh, morally. So here's one of the big problems. Uh, people today will often say phrases like, you know, uh, and I, I remember hearing Obama say this, and every time he would say this, uh, there would be this thing inside of me that was like, eh. But I've heard lots of other people say it too, that you're on the wrong side of history. What on earth does that mean? Well, it is a, a sentiment originating uh, from, basically from the Marxist perspective, although I don't think Obama was even aware of that because it had be, been filtered so many times by the time it got to him. Um, you know, through the educational process. But before that, uh, through Hegel, basically Hegel's dialectic says, you know, there's a this and a that, and eventually there's a third thing that's created by the clash of the two. To put Hegel in a rather simplistic nutshell. Uh, the assumption is that we know the course of history, that we're like surfing on the right side of it. Sometimes Christians get this idea that 
that, you know, we understand God's plan for history. To which I would say, I mean, Jacques a little firmly shot that one in the head and said, yeah, we don't understand God's plan for history. God does, is involved in history. But to say we understand the direction? No, it can't be done. Edith Schaefer, uh, Francis Schaefer's wife, said in a, uh, uh, a very interesting uh, phrase, uh, sometimes what she wrote was very romantic, but she did say something very interesting. And she said that uh, life is like a tapestry. The, 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 the warp and woof of the tapestry. Now, if you look, and what we're looking at is on the back side of the tapestry. And if you've ever seen the back side of the tapestry, you'll know it's pure chaos. You cannot see what's really happening with the picture being created on the other side. And God is creating the picture, in a sense, was what she was saying, but we're living in the chaos. So we really don't know which way we're going. Now, secular folks, on the other hand, might say things like, uh, talk about evolution in the same way, that we are evolving towards something. Uh, that we are consciously choosing to evolve, which is even, I find, more... Uh, it's kind of comical, actually, to think that we are consciously evolving. And, and the underlying um, implication here is that evolution equals progress. C.S. Lewis actually has some great... Uh, essays dealing with this, one of them called The Funeral of a Great Myth, which I highly recommend. But basically, it's the notion that evolution equals progress through history, through geological history, through cosmological history, that everything has been moving towards a certain place. Now, some real materialist atheists will try to be logical and basically state that, you know, evolution is... Uh, kind of fluky. We don't know why it moves. Essentially, all evolution means is change. So do things evolve? Yeah, they do. They change. Are they getting better? You know, are we more adapted now? I mean, look at humanity. <laughs> but, but look at almost anything. Do things just always evolve to be the right sort of thing? No, they just simply change for a variety of reasons, which I'm not going to discuss. C.S. Lewis has some interesting uh, thoughts. He says, the notion of history in most people's heads is confused. And that is to say, they could mean one of many different things when they say the word history. And he talks about, in his essay on historicism, he says there are uh, six different senses in which the word history is used. And I'm going to go with his definitions here. I'm not going to pick up pick them apart too much, but I'll just give you a, his idea of what they were. Sense number one is the total content of time, past, present, and future. So basically, history is everything in time. That's sense number one. Sense number two, he says, is the total content of the past only. Sense number three is so much of the past as is discoverable from surviving evidence. Sense number four, so much as has been actually discovered by historians. Sense number five, that portion and that version of the matter so discovered, which has been worked up by great historical writers. So in other words, it's, we're getting more specific here. Sense number six, that vague composite picture of the past which floats rather hazily in the mind of the ordinary educated man. And I might add here, being in Georgia, uh, there are people for whom the past is just kind of always mythological. And that's one thing I noticed. But I'm not going to go too much further into trying to pick apart other senses of the past. But we'll give C.S. Lewis his due here. So C.S. Lewis goes on to talk about uh, historicism and history. He says, it's not a question of failing to know everything that is about history. It is a question, at least as regards of quantity, of knowing next door to nothing. Each of us finds that in his own life, every moment of time is completely filled. A single second of lived time contains more than can be recorded, and every second of past time has been like that for every man that has ever lived. 
And I would add that everywhere you go, you know, we could talk about history of dogs even, you know, so it's like, how did they get to be bred? Well, then you start looking at the behavior of dogs, it gets endless. If you're just to think about what you did this morning, you know, it's like if I say, what did you do this morning? Uh, how did you wake up? A lot of people would say, well, I woke up and I went to uh, use the restroom, then I started cooking breakfast, and I made coffee, and then I started reading stuff online, you know. There's that sort of thing. But if you really look at it, you could go like, well, I heard the alarm clock ring. And I groggily kind of thought about getting up and then let it go back into snooze mode. And then I heard it go into snooze mode and I clicked it again. And I kind of started to fade off. And then I woke up. Well, I'm giving you what happened this morning. <laughs> Do you want to hear the rest of this story? No. <laughs> Why? And even in that, you can go into fractals of what happened, you know, b between the snoozes and stuff. It's just crazy. Um, and you can start describing the environment and the room. This is not my bedroom, by the way. This is just a backdrop. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, that's a lot. That's what C.S. Lewis is talking about. Is, you know, things are constantly happening. And if I walk down the street, for instance, the fact that a tree is shedding... Right now, I'm walking by these, these grape uh, bushes, and they're dropping. No one's picking the grapes. It's a, it's a weird story. I don't want to go into it right now. It's just like, it's like there's so many grapes in Georgia that they're just falling on the ground, and no one's eating them. I mean, what a great place to be homeless. And, um, um, but, you know, it's like, if I was to think about the fact that there are grapes falling right now, and that I could accidentally step on one, now I could, many things could happen. I could slip and fall, or I could uh, uh, get it stuck on my foot and have to clean my shoe later, or something like this. All of this goes into it. And, and so that, you know, I'm walking outside, but then there's the history of the tree. This is what I mean about time, everything having a different history. And it affects each other going back and forth, like the mythological, because it, it never really happened, butterfly who flaps its wings and creates a, a tsunami or, or rather a storm over in Tokyo. I mean, that was just like a, <laughs> it's a very random example. It doesn't happen like that. And uh, it's common mythology. C.S. Lewis goes on to say, we ride with our backs to the engine. We have no notion what stage in the journey we have reached. Are we in Act 1 or Act 5? Are our present diseases those of childhood or senility? We don't know. We don't know where we are in the story of humanity or in the story of reality or the universe. He says, if I attack historicism, it is not because I intend any disrespect to primary history. The real revelation spring direct from God in every experience. It is rather because I respect the real original history too much to see with unconcern the honors due to it lavished on those fragments, copies of fragments, copies of copies of fragments, or floating reminiscences of copies of copies which are unhappily confounded with it under the general name of history. So what he's really saying here is, now I understand the, the kind of, the notion, there's a difference between the past and history. The past is everything that happened in the past. And history has to do with, um, uh, I, I think a historian would see it, it has to do with what we can know about the past, the records. But, He's saying, even, you know, if we lavish on these little fragmentary bits of the past that we do carry on, um, we are disrespecting the real thing by essentially, and the real thing is everything, you see. We are disrespecting it by making too much of the little fragments. Nevertheless, I think those fragments have a great value, and I'm sure he would say that as well, as he was a scholar and spent a lot of time looking at the fragments. Ooh, dogs are barking. That's <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I've been hearing a lot of them lately. 
Um, I think it's these dogs guarding these uh, large construction works that are going on next door. Okay, enough of that. Enough dogs. Uh, C.S. Lewis also says... No. <laughs> Where am I? Okay. Another thing that people, uh, that I, another thing I need to warn, okay, we've got squealing kids, we've got dogs, I've, I'm trying to get through this. It's funny, every time I start talking, I hear that suddenly the little child will go, squeal! Maybe you don't hear it, but I hear it, and it affects me. So, to continue. So, another issue with history that is a problem is the phrase, History is written by the winners. And people as diverse as Napoleon, uh, Walter Benjamin, uh, and more recently Dan Brown of the uh, rather insipid uh, Da Vinci Code have said the same thing. Uh, it kind of goes along with the following uh, statement. Every record has been destroyed or falsified, every book rewritten, every picture has been repainted, every statue and street building has been renamed, every date has been altered, the process is continuing day by day and minute by minute, history has stopped, nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always, always right. George Orwell from 1984. And what he's basically saying there is in the dystopia, everything is changed by the winners, and, and constantly, the way Stalin did, uh, they would erase people from pictures and from books uh, to reflect only what the winners uh, think is right for everyone to read. Now, there is something to be said for this. However, and there's a big however. However, if history is only written by the winners... What in the heck am I doing? I work with history. I am not one of the winners. <laughs> so anybody can actually deal with history. Now, in this sense, this is the history which is we go back and read and we understand. Well, yeah. But the truth is, you can. I can go back right now and read histories uh, from the past. Uh, histories where, you know, the white man was the savior. Histories where... Uh, you know, everything that we think now is considered wrong. There should be a king. There should be, uh, you know, people who will justify slavery, whatever. Um, but what I'm doing right now, especially in my How We Got Here series, is reinterpreting history as I have come to understand it, and I hope accurately. And I think... That is valuable as history. And maybe it's the kind of history that will stay buried for a while, and then eventually someone will discover it. When there are new winners, is that is that how it's supposed to work? I don't think so. I think, and this brings us to some interesting ideas. So, I think history is valuable. It isn't always propaganda and lies about the past. For instance, and even those things that were certainly tainted by the ideology of their time. So whether it was in England, it was tainted by the idea of empire, or in America, tainted by the idea of manifest destiny, or, you know, in any other culture, even, even Soviet uh, stuff, there's still something valuable to be gleaned from those things. And if you don't read them, and if you only think that what happens today and how we interpret it today is the only valuable source of information, you're wrong. Because there's, there's no way to understand the past. And I think actually one of the worst things that's going on right now is there is, you might say, the supposed victors, that is to say the people who control education, are rewriting history as a series of deconstructions of the past, um, going back and pointing out how it, you know every uh, sin in the past, according to modern lights, uh, needs to be... Uh, inverted, reappropriated, uh, deconstructed, pulled apart, you know. And I would say, not so fast. Not everything in the past was wrong. We need to have some idea of how to judge those things. That's important. 
So let's talk about the value of history. George Orwell said this. He wasn't a, a person who thought that history was all falsified. In fact, just the opposite. He thought when we got to the point where everything is renamed and redescribed, which is what's happening in the rather dystopian view of the new uh, theoretical people in universities as they deconstruct and reconstruct everything in their own image. He says the most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. That's pretty amazing. Let me read that again. The most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. So in other words, to take out their understanding of their history and substitute for it your understanding of their history, or rather the top-down version. In a sense, history can be a way of fighting against the dominant interpretation. Here's another one. To be ignorant of what occurred before you were born is to remain always a child. For what is the worth of human life unless it is woven into the life of our ancestors by the records of history? Cicero, the great Roman uh, orator and uh, writer. From 2,000 years ago. Or again, history is a people's memory. Without a memory, man is demoted to the lower animals. Malcolm X. And that was tremendously important for people during the civil rights movement to grasp the fact that they were not simply stuck in the now of prejudice, but rather there was a history of people who had fought for ideas and also a history of unique people living within specific milieus and cultures. And that is how we know who we are. Uh, while I have moved to Georgia, what's funny is, is when I was living in Alaska, I was the guy who would tell people about the country of Georgia. Well, I don't need to tell anybody about the country of Georgia here. Suddenly, I'm an American again. And in fact, I'm a Californian. I'm, a, I'm an Alaskan. I'm a New Yorker. I am also a person who's traveled through Europe uh, studying puppet history and other things. So all of the, that... All of the aspects of my own history feed into who I am and what I understand about myself. Finally, one cannot and must not try to erase the past merely because it does not fit the present. It's a very important statement. And that's from Golda Meir. So there you are, people from very different backgrounds. Uh, you know, Israeli African-American, ancient Roman, British, all basically saying, and I'm sure I could find examples from India and China and the rest of it. Everyone understands that history is important to understanding yourself, but also, I think, for locating yourself in time. So then, one way of entering into time is through history. But like memory, that doesn't mean you're actually going to find the meaning you're looking for, but... You can perhaps locate your position on the chronological map as far as the road as, as far as the road is gone. That is say, you can say, okay, well, here we are. We're not there anymore, we're here. You can find yourself to some degree. You cannot find how far you are you have left to go. That is to say, you know, I'm older now than I was 30 years ago. That doesn't mean I know how long I'm going to live. I could live another 30 years, or I could live two more days. Who knows? So we come to this question, and this is really important to me, and I'm certainly not going to be saying everything I think about the subject, but how to approach history. And the, the answer isn't just go out and buy a bunch of history books. The answer certainly isn't to go out and buy history textbooks. Textbooks are terrible. They tell you a little bit. They give you an idea. They're also way overpriced. But, uh, but rather, there are good history books that I, I can recommend. But I'm not going to be recommending a lot of history books in this. I might mention a few authors. 
Again, this is not an <clears throat> academic treatise on history. This isn't even a particularly deep dive into the subject of history. But I just want to give you an introduction, because if you're like many people, you're kind of swimming in the now. <laughs> and you need to swim into the past to understand where you are now and how you might get to the future. So, first of all, you have to realize that history is messy. And it takes real work to know it. How messy is history? Well, one thing you can almost always say is the popularized conception of a period is always different than the period actually was. But actually, it was Susan Sontag in her essay, Notes on Camp, where she talks about the first thing to lose of a period of time is the taste, the flavor of that time. Um, one time that people often go back to these days is the 1960s. And there's been a, a, and one of the reasons why I, I felt it very important in my How We Got Here uh, series to discuss more of the problems of the 1960s is to show you that essentially it isn't what the media presents to us in the 1960s. That's not what it was. I mean, I can say that as someone who was alive then. It had a very different taste, a different flavor. A film that I really don't like is Forrest Gump. The way it portrays the 60s, it just makes me want to shoot myself. Because it's like, no, it wasn't like that. Especially the way it kind of goes from one thing to another to another. Like, it, like the 60s was all these set pieces. It wasn't like that at all. There, it had a completely different feel. Next, we need to realize that history in our times is completely under attack by propaganda. And that is to say that it, it, you can't even go back to the past without understanding that so much of where we are now wants to control the past. Now, you, one could argue that it was always this way, and then you end up back in the history is always written by the winners discussion. And I would disagree with that. But the point is, today... Just as in, say, Stalinist uh, 1930s and 40s in Russia, there is an active uh, element of people who want to scrub away all the bad interpretations of what happened in the past. They want to make it less messy. They don't want it to be so painful. And they want to keep us safe from it, which to me is ridiculous. One place you're never safe is in looking at, it, at history. And that's another important thing to understand. Uh, there's a great book uh, that was written, well, great is probably the wrong word, a good book that was written by this uh, historian back around 1980, 81, called uh, Truth in History by Oscar Handlin. A good book on the philosophy of history. And basically he said this. He says, the most important thing is to get the truth and the accuracy of what happened in the past to the degree we ha can. He was also at that point, being an older history professor, he was just starting to feel the attack of uh, studies of race and gender upon history and how he already saw that, that the people involved with the various uh, liberation struggles of the 1960s and 70s, particularly uh, black studies, gay studies, feminist studies, really didn't care about what actually happened. They cared more about making their points. But I would say this, as a person who has been in the Christian world, I've seen the exact same thing from Christians. They are so worried about, you know, keeping their, their own interpretation correct and that they do not understand the violence they are doing to what actually happened. Um... But, you know, even the title of his book, Truth in History. Now, the question is this, what is truth? Now, some people will say there is no such thing as capital T, truth. I would disagree. There is truth. But here's the point. There is no such thing as exhaustive truth, except as God would see it. As we would see it, there is no such thing as exhaustive truth. And any person who tells you they think there is, that they know all the truth, yeah, Walk away from that person. They don't understand what they're even saying. Um, but here's how it works. Yes, there is truth. How do we know? 
Well, right now I'm looking at cats crawling across a, a roof from me. What are cats? Now, you might ask 10 different people or, or maybe six people. You know, cats to one person are like these cute uh, creatures. They're always, you know, they post, they're, you know, cat, why are there so many cat memes? Because cats make these faces that people interpret as cute. Uh, to another person, they would see cats quite rightly as perhaps one of the most destructive, invasive species on Earth. Cats have parasites. There's one theory that cats uh, uh, colonize their owners through uh, allowing these weird little parasites to get into us. Um, I don't know how much truth there is in that, but nevertheless, there is a view. Other people only see cats as cartoon creatures, as as uh, uh, anime animals, as as cartoons and and cute cuddly things. Uh, uh, and, you know, another person might see cats as kind of like, I've seen cats in graveyards quite a bit, especially in France. You go to a graveyard in France, and I remember once walking through a graveyard, seeing an older woman come with a bag of food for the cats. And I looked around me. This was not a scene out of the musical Cats. This was something much more frightening. I looked around, I saw one cat coming out from behind a graveyard, and another cat coming out from behind a graveyard, and another cat. And pretty soon I looked, and there was like 50 cats all coming towards this woman. This was not a sign of beauty or love. This was, you suddenly realize, oh, these, all these predatory animals eating what? What could they all be eating? Well, I'm sure they're eating rats, among other things. So, but, but what's a cat? Is it a household pet? Is it, has it colonized humanity? Has it learned how to look at us in a certain way and go, they certainly do know how to do that. And they know if they make certain images, and they teach each other this, that they can get something from us. And what's interesting in Georgia is how different cats are in Georgia compared to what they are in America. In America, they're often seen, you rarely see cats outside in America the way you see them here. Here, I mean, it, there's like supposedly a million and a half people in Tbilisi, Georgia. I'm estimating there's at least 500,000 cats on the streets here. And nobody, hardly anybody seems to have a cat in the house. They're all outside. But people all love cats here. But they like them outside. <laughs> so they feed them. The cats, every time I open the door, they're waiting. And I have a little squirt gun filled with vinegar that I spray when I want to give them the message, don't come. Uh, otherwise, they'll run into the house. Uh, you know, they're very good at taking over. So what's a cat? Well, of course, I hear a dog barking in the distance. Cat's a very different thing to a dog. Well, well here's the point. Everyone can have their different points of view depending on what they've seen. If you've been scratched by a cat and, and your hand's been infected your view of cats is going to be very different than the person who's only been around kittens. That doesn't mean we can't know what cats are. And nobody gets dogs and cats confused unless they have, you know, perceptual problems. But then we call them perceptual problems. So no, we know what cats are. We can get closer to understanding what cats are the more we understand of cats. So there is a truth we can approach. In other words, we can go from a state of ignorance, not knowing anything at all about cats, further and further and further to a state of understanding something. More than we knew before. Closer to understanding what a cat is. Of course, to really understand what a cat is, you'd have to know every cat that ever existed and every human's relationship to every cat. And not only that, you'd have to know about the cats on South Georgia Islands uh, that are down there eating the mice and rats that fled sh whaling ships. <laughs> you know, in other words, there's there's huge. I mean, there are like there are uh, islands that have been the had the bird population decimated by feral cats. All of this under the heading of cats. Plus, we haven't even discussed wild cats, and we haven't discussed lions and tigers and bears. Well, those are different, aren't they? Oh my. But actually, the other day, I looked outside my window and I saw something I had never seen before in a cat. This was new information about cats. And what I saw was a cat laying down next to one of the local cats that had 
leopard-like spots on it. And it was, it was slightly bigger than normal cats and slightly longer. And it had brown skin and leopard spots. And I just looked at that and I said, what is that? Is that, that's not just a normal cat. I later realized there is a wild cat that lives in Georgia. New bit of truth added in, teeny, teeny bit of truth added to my ignorance. Anyway, so there is truth. So that means we can also know more about history than we do now. So you, who might be starting with, I don't know, a video game about the Middle Ages with, uh, you know, dragons and gnomes. Let me tell you something. You know nothing about the Middle Ages playing a video game with dragons and gnomes. However, you might uh, see something in that. Well, we're going to come to that in a moment. Olin Barfield has another way of looking at the, uh, how we understand the truth, and that is through the imagination. And in his concept of final participation, that we can participate in our imagination with the past. What is the Eucharist, the communion, if not an imaginative re-entry back into the past? And maybe even much, much more than that, if the Catholics and the Orthodox are correct. So, um, we can, in a sense... By If I read, for instance, Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, I can actually begin to imagine, using what I know about rafts and water and Missouri, start to imagine actually with Mark Twain actually floating down the river on a raft in the middle of the 19th century. That's pretty amazing. And that would be how Barfield would describe our approach of the past. So to me, there are two ways. One, finding the truth of events, and two, imaginative entry into that truth. Now, of course, if you just use your imagination as, say, certain kinds of uh, uh, serial fiction teach us to do, that's a problem. You need some real solid evidence to build on. So how do you start? Well, let's start from a source. Like I said, it could be an essay in a magazine, it could be a historical drama, a feature film, or a television series. Uh, it could be, although you're a long way from anything resembling history, that, that video game with dragons and trolls and set in a medieval situation. But even there, there is a way to find your way back towards something historical. Although, how much that... Uh, you know, you have to escape the net of the fictional, uh, fictitious universe. I hate using that word. Uh, people talk about the Star Wars universe or the Marvel universe. It's like, no, they're just worlds. I mean, yeah, Marvel is like, okay, it's a whole galaxy, a whole universe, but it's still overblown uh, to talk about universes. Uh, and, and nowadays, it's kind of like people have extended it to, what, the Agatha Christie universe? That's like, it's just crime stories set supposedly in our time, our age with, uh, you know, kind of their own character and, and universe is just really stretching. Okay, enough of my little, uh, uh, <laughs> just annoyance. So you could start somewhere. You could start with a book like Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, a novel or, or, uh, I don't know, uh, Dracula by Bram Stoker. You know, the, you get you start somewhere and you start to get interested in something of the feel of, of another era. So, um, then what do you do? You learn to see the signs of historical anachronism. That's one thing you can do. Uh, you, can, you can do a little bit of research, but what do I mean? First of all, a lot of these more modern versions of the past have historical anachronisms. How would you see that? Well, for instance, if you saw a movie like Knight's Tale with the rock music behind it, well, you can say, 
Not, and here's the important thing. Not only did they not have uh, rock music in the past, they didn't have the attitude that goes with it. That's the important thing. It's not simply that they didn't have rock music, although that would be a bit dead giveaway that, of an anachronism, but they didn't have the attitude that goes with rock music. That is a modern attitude. And in fact, it's a modern attitude that's passing because rock music no longer means what it meant in the 1960s or 70s or 80s or 90s. Rock music essentially as a, as a movement of sorts is kind of over. All we have now is music that people like and people get fascinated by their own little culture, but it doesn't have that larger cultural significance. Um, another way to tell historical anachronisms in uh, media is through hairstyles. Hairstyles are amazingly bad. <laughs> it's amazing. Did uh, anyone have dreadlocks like Mel Gibson in, in old Scotland? Uh, he, uh, you know, the kind of, well, it wasn't just dreadlocks, but, but it was this kind of big hair and stuff. I mean, does the fact that that film was just coming, uh, you know, after the 80s have anything to do with that? I think so. Just as if you go to the 1960s, you see people in the Middle Ages like Sophia Loren and El Cid having this perfectly quaffed 60s teased kind of look, you know, and you say to yourself, no, I don't think so. Or, or just the fact that all the clothing is so neat and, and freshly designed. They've gotten better at that. The Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy certainly did better than that as far as uh, aging things and making them look lived in. And that's something we've gotten better at. Not that we've gotten perfect at our reconstructions, though. But you often see this in films. And, and, and beware of this when you see films that claim to be about the past. And we are deceived because we see something happening in a, a conceivable past. It looks antique. It looks old. And yet what you hear is often someone talking about things about today. And of course, some people have said, well, the, the whole point of, of any sort of historical film is to comment on today. Yeah, well, what is the point of the historical film? If you see, for instance, uh, Spartacus in, you know, Stanley Kubrick made that at the beginning of the 1960s. And, and maybe that was, I know that was written by a man who was commenting on what was happening in the 1950s. But yeah, when, when you watch Spartacus today, it isn't commenting on today at all. So maybe there are other reasons uh, to understand these things. So here's the problem. You find films where people supposedly from the past are virtue signaling to us today uh, in the modern audience about issues we care about, like, you know, uh, feminism, sex and gender issues, racism. You know, why are so many of our films about following our hearts? Did anyone, for instance, in, um, I mean, I'm trying to think of people in uh, Charles Dickens novels writing about following your heart. Uh, it wasn't the same, you know, it's, uh, it, it, you know, yeah, there's people trying to, to push ahead, but the further back you go, the more, the weirder it looks to impose our ideologies upon the past, you know, like that every woman in the middle ages was seeking to rise above the treatment of women. No, they weren't. They were living day to day. They weren't thinking of things like we do. And the fact is the way we think are often uh, propagandized uh, forms of deeper thoughts uh, that people have had about these very same issues. So maybe you could do a little bit more research. You could read a Wikipedia article, or probably better yet, something in the Encyclopedia Britannica. And yet the problem with these things is, you know, any sort of encyclopedia is it's a good place to start. Do not. Do not end there. If you end at Wikipedia, if you read Wikipedia and think you know something, you can be sure you do not. You have only gleaned what is, uh, you know, gleanable for a person who just is picking, cherry picking the surface. And even then, Wikipedia is known for being kind of, of, of uh, being biased on many issues, particularly the way people come back and correct things because they don't like the way that uh, someone has written it. 
Um, it's better to read to find books on a subject written by someone who would be considered trustworthy. And that's difficult. But, you know, for instance, if you start to get in, interested in something like military history, you need to find someone who's authoritative to write on the subject. So, for instance, I've gotten a lot out of John Keegan's work. Uh, his work on military history is, is just amazing. Works like The Face of Battle. Um, you know, it's just... It's, it's knowing that this person knows their stuff. We live in a time today where the idea of thor authoritative information is almost like anathema to people. They just think like, well, I can go on Wikipedia and we can just kind of pool our knowledge together and we will learn something. And I've always learned if I would much rather spend time with a person who is truly knows something and has done research than I would with someone who just has intuitions about things. Because this person doesn't, when it comes to understanding history, they don't know what they're talking about. They have to spend time. So I'd like to read Jack a little about technology. I'd like to read Ernst Gombrich on uh, the Renaissance. You know, and there are many other people you learn. Or there are authoritative sources. Like I really liked, uh, there was a book, uh, The Penguin Encyclopedia of Horror, uh, that came out uh, back in the 1980s. Amazing book. It's amazing how much I've learned from that book. A lot of detailed information. Um, but you should never, ever completely agree with writers. You need to learn to question them to form your own opinions, but that's a different subject. And finally, you should read the old books yourself. You shouldn't just read someone talking about Plato. You should read Plato. You shouldn't just read someone talking about Dickens. You should read Dickens. And you shouldn't just read books about the past from today. You should read books published 50, 100 years ago about the past as well. I know that's more difficult, but you should. You should. And here's why. This is uh, for, uh, one of my favorite uh, essays of C.S. Lewis. It's called On the Reading of Old Books, and I'm going to read you a section here, a uh, couple of paragraphs. Listen to this, and if you can, grab it. Understand what he's saying. He says this, Every age has its own outlook. It is especially good at seeing certain truths and especially liable to make certain mistakes. We all, therefore, need the books that will correct the characteristic mistakes of our own period. And that means the old books. All contemporary writers share to some extent the contemporary outlook, even those, like myself, who seem most opposed to it. The only palliative is to keep the clean sea breeze of the centuries blowing through our minds. And this can be done only by reading old books. Not, of course, that there is any magic about the past. People were no cleverer then than they are now. They made as many mistakes as we, but not the same mistakes. They will not flatter us in the errors we are already committing. Two heads are better than one, not because either is infallible, but because they are unlikely to go wrong in the same direction. To be sure, the books of the future would be just as good a corrective as the books of the past, but unfortunately we cannot get to them. Now, what C.S. Lewis meant by old books is not what we would mean by old books. We tend to think that, you know, like a book written 25 years ago is kind of old. He meant books written like 200, 300 years ago. However, for us, it would be important for us to read books that are 30, 40, 50 years old or older and older. And that's the way we can correct the blindnesses of our times. And you have blindnesses just as I have blindnesses because we all have blindnesses. So, my recommendation is to... You know those books that are considered classics? Moby Dick. Um, you know, the works of Shakespeare. Uh, Jane Austen. Those things. 
you should read those books. So finally, as one last aside, you should also handle things of the past, not just read books. Don't simply own cheap reproductions of things. Why? I, I often say to people, you know, you really don't need reproductions of paintings and such. Better to spend a few dollars and find a local artist and, and own a real painting, even if it's not the Mona Lisa, on your wall. Uh, but it's better to hold things that are older, you know. Don't just buy antiques to be antique, but don't buy imitation antiques either. I mean, people are great at selling you things that look like they've been antiqued. I'd spend a few more, take a, you know, a little bit more time to go into a store and buy some old thing and put it on your shelf or use an old lamp or something. Um, and don't just buy digital substitutes. You know, one of the things that bothers me as a person who collects records is to see a generation of people who do not really understand the value of the thing itself, uh, whether it's books or rec records, CDs, DVDs. More and more people are using the download, the stream. So these things just kind of get recorded and erased and shuffled off through the head. They don't even download them. They just watch them and they shuffle off into, you know, some sort of oblivion. And my feeling is, is that, you know, take time to find things to, I mean, there's a joy in finding old books. I mean, even in Georgia, it's hard for me to find all the books I'd like to. So I do try to order things from further beyond, but I have found books in English here that I can write or books that are, have, uh, Often Georgian, Russian, and English all in one. That, those are kind of interesting art books. But to, to then have that book and be able to repeat to it and hold it and feel the weight of it. Now that's, we're talking about space here, not time so much. But, in, in the, but the point is this, is that the reproductions are like pretending like you can own something that's really old. Well, no, you can't, not unless you spend a little bit more money, you're not going to hold something own something that's really old, unless you get it inherited, which would be great. Um, but the point is, having a digital copy means you own a thing that is, again, outside of time, supposedly. It's not really. Digital stuff corrodes eventually in the end, too. Uh, anyway, you need to locate yourself in history. And so in our last uh, episode, what we're going to discuss is using your memory to find your own history and your own time and to, to, to have some sort of sense of what it means to live in time, which includes the past, includes dealing with the present in order to get to a future which has open options as opposed to a future which is like a giant snowball that is running behind you and is going to get bigger and bigger until it wipes you out. Rather, a future which has open ends to it, uh, possibilities. And I'm not saying this as a, I am no self-help motivation speaker. I'm talking about this on just purely meaningful level of you need this to live as a human being. All people always have needed these things to live. And finally, I will remind you, however, before you dig into your own past, just as I say this in digging into history and the messiness and the frighteningness of sometimes what you will find in history. It says, Solzhenitsyn quotes the rough Russian proverb talking about digging up the past. He says, no, don't, don't dig up the past. Dwell on the past and you'll lose an eye. But he says the Russian proverb goes on to say, forget the past and you'll lose both eyes. And that's what Solzhenitsyn said about digging into both the past, history, and your own past. You'll see things you really don't want to see, and it'll scar you. But if you don't see it, you'll be blindsided. So, I've spent long enough on all of this today, and I appreciate you spending this time with me discussing history. Believe me, I've only just 
barely scratched the surface on, on an approach to history. I just wanted to give you a little bit of something to think about, about how to look at history and next week, how to look at your own history. So, uh, like the thing, that's important. Sharing it. If you like what I'm saying here, share it with somebody. I don't care who, but somebody. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be big, but share it. It helps. And maybe there's something of value in what I'm doing here. Um, and you can also, if you wish to contribute, it certainly would be helpful. Uh, you will see a PayPal down in the link below, a PayPal link. And uh, if you give more than $10 a month, you get extras. And uh, here's a little uh, sign right here that explains the how to do that. Just click on that and you will get learn about the extras, what, what I have in store for you, mystery content. Um, but you can also get it through $50 contribution or more. So, and I am grateful that people have been contributing. And the truth is, your contributions have really kept me alive. And George, I can't, I don't want to poor mouth, but uh, yeah, uh, oh, just due to the things that happened that I had no advanced warning for. I am really grateful to all of you. You've all been very kind, those who have generated, and those who watch. I appreciate the fact that you would spend all this time uh, with me. And so, remember, anadromous is a word that means swimming against the stream, and that's what I'm asking you to do. Don't go along with what is obvious and easy to do. You know, you can spend your whole day just involved in consuming media, you can spend your whole day focusing on yourself, thinking about the money you're going to get, the vacation you're going to take. And I'm asking you to think differently than that and to think about the point of living in time is not to live selfishly, but it's to live so that your life matters to other people. So, swim against the stream. Farewell. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.